Hey everybody, I'm Matt. This is the 10 Minute Bible Hour. And did you hear that Jupiter and Saturn are going to line up this week? As I record this, I am less than a week out from what's called a conjunction of the planets, Jupiter and Saturn. And this is going to be the most impressive, tightest, make them look like they're one thing conjunction that we've had visible to the human eye since like the 1200s AD. That's insane. Well, there's a really obvious question that goes along with this, right? I mean, it's December 21st. That's the winter solstice. Christmas happens right around there. And even though we generally think of astrology from the ancient world as being something you associate with paganism, there is that one glaring exception, isn't there? The Christmas star. So is this it? Is it possible that this conjunction on this very long repeating pattern is what the Magi of Matthew chapter 2 saw from their the home in the east, maybe Persia, that caused them to mount up on camels and go on a very long trip to try to find Jesus. That is the question we're going to explore in this video, as well as looking at other things that the Christmas star might have been. Once again, I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour. Let's get after it. So we go to Matthew chapter 2, and let's just See what we're working with here. Uh, verse 1, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Okay, east here probably means Persia. At this point in history, everybody would have been well aware that there was an India and there was a China, but India and China operated in two very different cultural orbits. We don't get a lot of cross-pollination at this point in history. Persia would be the furthest east expression of the cultural West. So we're probably talking about Persia, but we're also probably talking about Persia because there had been a Jewish presence there for a long time. In the 500s BC, the people of Judea were conquered, or Judah rather, were conquered and hauled off into captivity by the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar. There were some pretty amazing things that happened there that are recorded. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are these guys that get thrown into a furnace and they don't die. That kind of story would have lingered and the Magi from the East would have heard about that. Further than you get Daniel, who was a savant. I mean, he just he knew stuff and amazing things happened around him, miraculous stuff. He predicted stuff. He proved himself useful to more than one empire. And anybody in the same line of work from Persia, even up to the time of Jesus, they would have heard of that guy. And they would have specialized in astrology, religious texts, religious traditions, prophecy. So they would have had their antenna out for anything that was more rumblings from the Jewish people and their religion and their God. They thought there was maybe something to it. And this star was enough to get them off the schneid. And so they talked to King Herod and they asked, where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. So, okay, Persia, let me do this for you. It'd be this way. Persia is the farthest east expression of Western culture at this point in history. And Jerusalem, Judea, Bethlehem, that would be quite a ways west of them. So when they say we saw a star in the east, does that mean they were looking further east, like toward China? I mean, maybe they're describing a star that started further east and moved west. Or maybe they're just saying we were standing in Persia, the east, when we saw the star. When I see this alignment of Jupiter and Saturn, I'm going to say I saw it in South Dakota. The alignment didn't happen in South Dakota. It's just where I was standing when I saw it. So I'm not sure we get a lot of clues from that language. Well, Herod hears about this. He's disturbed. Jerusalem is disturbed as well. They're trying to figure out what all of this stuff means. And some religious leaders remind Herod that the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, however you want to say it, is supposed to be born in Bethlehem in Judea. They cite a prophecy from the prophet Micah, which dates back to the 8th century BC, that goes like this. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. So then Herod calls back the Magi, and he secretly asks them for the exact time the star had appeared. And then he said to them, well, you know, go and find the kid and tell me, and then I want to come worship him too. And so after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed, and they went there, and they gave the gifts, and the whole nativity scene thing happens, and it's really, really awesome. Okay, so we have some things that don't really fit 
a description of a star as you or I would think of it. Like stars, they don't move like that. You know, you've seen the pictures where somebody takes a, a camera and they do a great big long exposure for several hours in the night and you get the cool rotation of the stars. And that isn't the stars moving. I mean, it's us moving. And so it, you get the cool streaks and it looks like the stars are moving. That's not how things work. But there are things that happen in the heavens where it's moving even while we're moving. And that would include planets like we've been talking about, but also comets. I don't know, comets, those things are hot. They're moving fast. Well, cold, hot, how does that work exactly? So some people have theorized that because of this description of the star moving, that what we're talking about here is actually a comet. And so, well, what do you do if you want to know? Well, you got tons of ancient records in terms of astronomy. Everybody was interested in this stuff. If there was a comet that fits the bill, there should be something. Well, it turns out that there are a couple. They were surely visible in the part of the world we're talking about here. The dates don't line up perfectly neatly, but this does account for the question of how the, quote, star could move. However, it takes a really long time to ride a camel from Persia to Jerusalem. And so that comet would have had to have hung around a lot longer than most. And then it says it kind of goes away and it reappears. Maybe it went past the sun and came back. It feels like a little bit of a stretch at any point. Now, at this point, some of you might be like, well, the Bible says star and you're talking about a comet. We've already jumped off the rails. It can't be a comet. It says star. Well, the thing is, you got to understand what the language was like at this point. We didn't have crystal clarity on these things all being burning, you know, balls of gas billions of miles away. They're just things that are in the heavens and they behave a little bit differently. And some people were a little more up to speed on what that meant than others. But the Greek language was equipped to use the word star to describe anything that would look like a star in the skies. So... Maybe linguistically you could make a case for star meaning comet, but it just doesn't fit the description. So I don't think you can make the best case for that. Some people have supposed that maybe this thing was a supernova or a nova. I guess a supernova is just bigger and explosiver. My understanding is that a supernova leaves some kind of remnant so you can tell where those things happened. And we don't get any account of anything like that. So it doesn't look like such a thing occurred in a supernova, which, I mean, that's a star blowing up, right? I mean, a supernova, well, that wouldn't happen and then unhappen so that the thing would unappear and then reappear. I'm not sure you could make the best case for that either. Well, then you come back to what a lot of the great astronomers of the Age of Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution thought, and that is that our conjunction theory might be the best one, that maybe there's some kind of an alignment. Now, not all conjunctions are between planets. That can also be between a planet and a star or two planets and a star. And it turns out that in terms of date, there are some conjunctions that line up fairly well. But in order to make sense of that, we probably got to specify a little bit this question of the date. What is our time frame here? So Herod the Great who we know was alive because, I mean, he's in this passage and he orders a whole bunch of babies to get killed to try to get rid of his supposed rival, Jesus. We know that Herod died in 4 BC. A few people argue that he died in 5 BC and a few people argue that he died closer to 2 BC. I've been through that data pretty carefully. I'm not much of an astronomer, but I'm at least a mediocre historian. I think the case for 4 BC is pretty rock solid. So that means that Jesus couldn't have been born in 1 AD as the medieval calculations attempted to figure out so that we could have a new epoch that began with the birth of Jesus. Jesus almost surely was born before the BC AD flip. Now, 4 BC would line up with the life of Herod and would work with this. However, we don't get any indication from the text that the Magi were there when Jesus was born. This probably happened after the fact. So pop quiz, how long does it take to ride a camel with a gigantic retinue and enough security all the way across the sands of Iran and Iraq and Jordan to get all the way to Jerusalem and then to track down one of a gazillion babies that had been born in a little town in the middle of nowhere? Like, how hard is that? I'm guessing it's not a quick process. And so... They could have set out long before Jesus was born. 
So some of these alignments that would take us back to, well, not just alignments, but some of these phenomena that would take us back to 7 BC can't instantly be dismissed because maybe they saw this thing and felt like they needed to get moving a few years before Jesus was born, and it just took them a real long time, and they had some business along the way. It also means that you can't dismiss some possibility of this bleeding into things happening much later. Maybe they saw the star right in the toward the end of Herod's life and they started their trip, but maybe it took them a long time to actually find the baby after they interacted with Herod. So you've got a three, four-year window to work with here. Anything after that starts to get a little bit sketchy. So what we know is that this Jupiter-Saturn alignment happened three times for whatever reason in relatively rapid succession around the time of Jesus. Now, this is where it gets a little more complex and I'm not smart enough or well-googled enough to fill in all the blanks exactly, but you've got an alignment between a star and Jupiter and Venus that happens around the time of Jesus that some people look at and they're like, well, that star, that means this and yeah, Jupiter, that means the king and Venus, and you add it all up and it points to this perfect lock and key fit for a prophetic fulfillment. I, I don't know, maybe, could be. You got other people who look at the alignment, the conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, and they say that would have been bright. It would have been on the horizon. It would have been the kind of thing that would have appeared to come and settle right over the top of a place one evening, could be. You've got other people who say, well, maybe this was just Jupiter in retrograde. From our perspective, it looks like Jupiter is moving one way through the sky, but at certain times, because of the relationship between our orbit and its orbit, it looks like it goes the other way for a little bit. But this isn't a rare enough occurrence for it to really stand out. So we come back to this equation. I mean, that was a wall of stuff. Thank you. You're very patient with me. We come back to this equation. If this was a natural occurrence, it must have been a natural occurrence that was rare enough for a group of people on the far end of the known world to spend a whole bunch of money to go and try to investigate what this thing is because they were that sure they were dealing with something real. So to them, it must have popped. But it also has to be something that was not so obvious that Herod or his court astrologers would have noticed it. Because according to the text, Herod is like, what? A star? Hmm? What are we doing? So it was news to him. So if there was some gigantic thing that appeared in the sky that looks like a supernova, which is depicted as looking like a cross, which I think that historical depiction is more about like the symmetry between the beginning of Jesus' life and the end, not about any actual representation of what it looked like. If there'd been something like that, Herod would have been like, I know, guys! I saw that too, and I asked my dudes about it, and they were like, well, we don't really know. Do you guys know what the thing is? But instead, his reaction is ignorance. Tell me more. So that tells me that this must have been something nuanced. Think about what you're awesome at. Think about the stuff that you, you specialize in that you know super well. Maybe it's a hobby. Maybe it's science, a skill, rhetoric, history. I don't know, whatever you're into. And think about the stuff that is so amazing to you, but that when you try to explain it to your family at Thanksgiving— it takes an hour to just help them understand how crazy this thing is that you're learning about or that's about to happen or that happened here. Well, that means you're a specialist and they were a specialist. And so I think it had to have been something that to them would have been a once every 800 years kind of fluky thing. But to everybody else would just like, like, you know, stars just being how stars are. It would have to be something visible enough for them to track maybe to check in with the same time each night over an extended period of time. And maybe it would need to be something meaningful enough to connect it with Jesus. For my money, that excludes a comet. For my money, that excludes a supernova. The historical data doesn't seem to be there. For my money, that only seems to point toward some kind of an alignment that wouldn't happen every single year. It would have to be rare. And so this conjunction theory, it does tick that box. Another possibility is, well, the whole thing was just supernatural entirely. And God just made a bonus star and that bonus star 
showed up and took these guys exactly where it needed to be. Maybe other people couldn't even see it. At that point, you get into theorizing that uh, to me isn't super compelling, but if the other miracles of the Bible could happen, I suppose God could have just made a star and used supernatural means to guide them to where they wanted to go. Here, for me, though, is the bottom line. The conjunction theory strikes me as the strongest of the natural explanations. But I come back to the point of the text. What is Matthew trying to accomplish here? We know we're dealing with a very talented writer. If you haven't read through Matthew and looked at it closely, uh, maybe this is foreign to you. But if you've spent any time with this, dang, it's immaculate. It's, It's amazing editing, amazing writing, the connections, the themes, everything resolves and works out. It's a beautiful piece of literature, and there's a reason it stood the test of time. Matthew is perfectly talented if the central point of what he wanted to accomplish in Matthew chapter 2 is to help us know what that natural phenomenon was. He could have told us, could have given us more details, could have spelled it out. Clearly, it is not the point. The point of the book of Matthew is not to be a science book. It's not even trying to. The point of the book of Matthew is to make the case that Jesus is the long-awaited king of everything, the long-awaited Christ, the Messiah, the one who was to come, who was predicted in the Old Testament and through all of the stories and lives and anecdotes and prophecies of everything that had happened in the past, everything that had occurred, Matthew is arguing all point toward the arrival of Christ, the king. And the argument is that he is a king. That's why it opens with a genealogy back here that points to his regal line. And it's why incredibly powerful, incredibly rich people would come and give gifts fit for a king. And that uh, the king who is right there and who should be excited about the arrival of the true king of his people isn't excited at all. It sets the stage for this who's the real king tension that plays out through the rest of the book. So for what Matthew is doing, this nails it. Jesus is king. For what I want to know about, because I'm just really interested in astronomy and I really like this convergence conjunction thing and I just want to know, it's not quite as useful. So what actually happened here? I don't know. I threw out a few theories. I'm interested to see in the comment section what you think was going on there. One way or another, it is fascinating to find these places in history where we can try to corroborate what's going on in a religious text like Matthew with a whole bunch of data that we have from a bunch of ancient sources. And it makes for a fun conversation between people who maybe wouldn't get together and kick around this stuff under any other set of circumstances. But this was a blast. Thank you for being willing to hang out with me and think about goofy questions from the past that deal with a story that I think has really meaningful and important implications for us now. I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour. Let's do this again soon.